who knows what Bitcoin's going to do, but I would assume that by the end of 2025, that 30% allocation will probably consume about 80 to 90% of the total portfolio. So our current strategy, we will begin dollar cost averaging out in tranches, and then we'll rinse for the in the next happening cycle. One thing that always gets me choked up is thinking about like an older lady who's living off this pension and some social security. Yes, inflation impacts me, but what about her? That's really sad. I think if you grew up in the South or in the Bible Belt, you probably are familiar with Dave. Bitcoin encourages a time preference that is antagonistic to our current state, which is very aligned with him. I think if you were to go on that thread hard enough and long enough, you'd find a lot of his principles that he's espousing actually are aligned with Bitcoin. I genuinely hope people in this space do not stop this pursuit of truth at Bitcoin. If you think owning Bitcoin and getting married is the end of life, you're wrong. This is something that just came across my radar, so I don't really have a lot of context about it. But I understand that uh, you had some involvement in planning this intentional living BTC mini conference. Uh, and I think it was just, what, like a week ago, a couple weeks back? Yeah, it was uh, just gotten back in town last week. Okay. Um, we were out in uh, Colorado for, for about a week. Small group of people escaping for... Yeah, we, we can talk more about it if you want. But it was sort sort of a conference, but not really. It was a it was a it was a non conference. Yeah, an unconference maybe. That's huh? Right. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I mean, why don't we just why don't you just give us a little bit about that? Uh, we can maybe start a conversation there. And um, so you you guys met with I think it was Preston Pish. Um, how big was the contingent? Yeah. Um, so I'll give you the, the rundown. So there was there ended up being thirty three people uh, present and. Uh, so, so we'll start there, but then going back to what this was, um, you know, I've gone to other, lots of other conferences and stuff and I, I don't love conferences like this mm -hmm. past year going to Miami, like I actually didn't get a ticket to the Bitcoin conference. I just went to hang out in Miami and would go work out on the beach and stuff in the day and maybe it'll get a little bit of work in. And then the evenings I would go to like dinners and parties and stuff and just have yeah. conversations. And my favorite part really was staying up at night and hanging out with the guys that I was rooming with and just talking with them about life and business and fun stuff like that. So it seems talking, talking to people, that's, that's everyone's feeling is, you know, you go to a conference, not for the content, you can get the content through, uh, through a podcast or YouTube, you go for the conversations had and the dinner shared. So it's sort I got thinking like, then why do we do these conferences? Why don't we strip out the part that no one wants and only leave room for the good stuff? So that's what I did. I set this thing up. It was really small. I, I wanted to keep it intimate and relatively private. Uh, so yeah, small group. We, we, we got two houses. We, we were living, bunking up in houses together. I mean, there were two phenomenal, like gigantic houses in Telluride, Colorado. But uh, yeah, like I interviewed probably about 90 people who reached out about wanting to do this and uh, selected 33 people who wanted to go. Uh, that'd be a good fit. And it was primarily as like Bitcoin maxis uh, who want to talk Bitcoin macroeconomics and pretty much everyone there is either a key, key leader in a business or a business owner. So we we're talking about business, Bitcoin and macro for a few days, um, sharing meals, going on hikes, going on Jeep tour. Um, and really the, the, the sole main purpose is to make time and space for really good conversation. I think that was accomplished. That's what you want, like going into things too. Like we all say, in the space that I work in, in supply chain, like there's so much energy around these conferences and shows and there's like hardly any follow through after the fact, everybody comes up all jazzed up being on that mountaintop. And then it just, what do you do after that? And it's seldom follow through ever, ever occurs, but it's, it's those conversations outside of, you know, the, the very detailed schedule that oftentimes lead to bigger and better things. Honestly, it's kind of what it's kind of how this podcast started for us, at least with the conference that we all met at. And it was the conversations, you know, outside of the, the meat and potatoes of what the conference was that, you know, ultimately created things it's kind of funny how that, that always happens. So I guess just, I know it's kind of the, Give us the quick cliff note version of your Bitcoin journey, essentially. I know everybody has a start somewhere. Um, we, we hear a lot of different uh, Bitcoin testimonies or crypto testimonies, but it, it's always interesting to, to hear it from a perspective of a financial planner. So I guess if you want to give us kind of the, the abridged version of your, uh, of your background, I think that would help for just some context for the audience. Yeah, I, I mean, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2012. There's a guy I worked with. We were living in Colorado at the time. A guy I worked with, uh, 
regularly would ask our boss to pay us in Bitcoin. Um, I didn't, I didn't really listen to what he had to say. I, I, I'm pretty confident he was stoned the majority of the time. So <laughs> he didn't, I, his words didn't carry much weight with me. Um, fast forward several years, uh, 2015, 2016 started hearing about it some more again. Um, started buying a little bit in, in 2015 and early 2016. Uh, the investors podcast with Preston oh, yep. Fish and Stig Borgerson, they started talking about Bitcoin, not the capacity that Preston does now, but more of a curious, somewhat analytical, somewhat skeptical view, I would say, um, which again, piqued my interest. I, I, I hold a lot of respect uh, for their minds, and especially in the investing area. And the fact that they would entertain having a conversation on their podcast about this thing, I meant it might be worth, you know, put my antennas up about it. Uh, so I started buying some here and there, uh, more of a just an, just another asset, less as um, the conviction I hold now. And that 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 position was maintained for several years. Um, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of the ugly side of uh, the cryptocurrency space through the like 2016, 2017 run up. I was working yep. at a large institution at that time. I had a lot of people I talked with who... I mean, Bitcoin peaked at about eighteen thousand. That yep. that that having period went up, and I talked to people who were taking mortgages on their house to go buy more Bitcoin at like seventeen, eighteen thousand, and uh, and people like not not just like oh, I'm going to get some debt to do this. Like people were leveraging their life to do this. So I, I saw a lot of the ugly side of uh, of short term thinking and irrational exuberance. Uh, that was based off hype rather than, you know, true long-term conviction um, in, in an asset. So, uh, yeah, that that sort of turned me off again. And then fast forward again to 2020. So March of 2020, when, uh, you know, government sort of shut everything down, money started being printed, everyone got the COVID relief checks, people were ecstatic, inflation hadn't hit yet, um, or at least we weren't feeling the impact of inflation at that point, everyone's just ecstatic. And, uh I, I quickly realized that there's something funny going on if 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 someone anyone be it the government or anyone else can arbitrarily create new money out of thin air, um, especially at the same time of shutting down uh, the all industries uh, that should create uh, demand. Um, so that that caused me to go to one and look and uh, find harder assets to invest in. So dug deeper into real estate. Other hard assets like gold um, and also Bitcoin. Shoot on that for several weeks, and came to the conclusion that of those three, uh, my my favorite is Bitcoin, uh, due to its uh, the different properties it holds, um, the coding that it's backed by, um, the network effects that it's that it that it contains. Um, decided to go pretty heavy there. So, I mean, just my personal uh, at that point, we basically moved all of our personal assets, essentially sold most of our traditional stocks and all that fun stuff and just went full into Bitcoin um, at that point. Wow. Okay. So that's, uh, that was your personal investments, um, right? Correct. Okay. So like where we're at right now, like I haven't owned a normal stock in several years. So personally, yeah. and then, I mean, that, I'm, I'm weird. I recognize that. And I don't tell my clients to do exactly what I do. They know what I do. And uh, I, I, I help them do these things on a similar basis as long as it makes sense for them. But my, my family, I mean, I basically own, uh, we own our house. We have a really good amount of equity in that. Um, we have an emergency fund of US dollars. I think that's smart. Some Bitcoin maxis say that that's foolish. I think they're foolish to not own that. Uh, we, own, we own Bitcoin. Um, we owned some Bitcoin mining companies, um, like in Roth IRA, stuff like that. Yep. And then I owned a few businesses and basically any free cash flow is either going to Bitcoin or going to, uh, you know, buying more money into our businesses and, and helping those grow. Okay. And one of those businesses is intentional living, uh, FP, right? Your financial planning practice. So you said in 2020, you were working for this other firm. When did you, when did you transition over to your own practice? Yeah, so I separated from that other firm in January of 21 and officially set up shop and began taking taking clients at, at Intentional Living uh, around March or so of 2021. Mm-hmm. So right at two and a half years of running, running the thing over here. Okay, oh, congratulations. So um, is, you said you don't advise your own clients to do exactly what you've done, 
But I imagine, you know, Bitcoin is such a big part of your life. It's, it must have some sort of impact on your financial planning practice. Would you say you're kind of a Bitcoin financial planner or what does, you know, the daily, I guess the daily business or the, the average client look like at intentional living? Yeah. So in, when I say they don't, I don't advise them to do exactly what I do. It's because I'm not a cookie cutter model. Most clients don't have the same conviction of Bitcoin that I do. They also don't have the same risk capacity nor the same risk tolerance. So we have to consider all these factors to consider how they should invest. So um, yeah, pretty much all of our clients do on Bitcoin. Um, so we help them understand what is Bitcoin. Most I, ha- I have some clients who came to me as Bitcoin maxis who then wanted to you know, work with a financial planner who didn't look at them like an alien when they talk about these things. So I do have clients who came from that direction, but the majority of our clients are, are normal people, uh, normal people who are looking for a normal financial planner. And uh, I then have the opportunity after gaining their trust and establishing credibility amongst these other areas of financial planning, like tax planning and estate planning and insurance and retirement, these normal things that normal financial planners do. Once I've established credit there, I can bring in the investment side of things. And I've been bring up uh, Bitcoin and uh, why I believe they should own that. And, uh, and we start unraveling that and talking through what is it? Why do we think should own it? How much they should own? How they own it? How do they acquire it? All of those things that are involved in, fin- in the uh, Bitcoin side of things pertaining to financial planning. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it certainly is a large part of our business. Oddly enough, I view this in two ways. One, it is a, it's a large part of our business, not because I view this as anything special in financial planning. Um, it's, it's just as important as tax planning or estate planning or other parts of financial planning. It just seems to be this large part because it's, it's unique. Um, you know, most financial planners ignore or uh, uh, ignore at best or belittle uh, Bitcoin. Um, so the fact that I uh, encourage it and utilize it and uh, talk through it, it, yeah, just makes it appear that it's this massive, monumental part of our of our practice. And right now, I guess it sort of is because there's, I'm unique. But hopefully in the future, uh, they won't be unique at all. That'll be just like talking about any other part of money. For sure, for sure. I, I'm going to throw it to Brandon to ask some more questions here in a second. But I don't know if you recall, yeah. but I work for a financial planner and we had a conversation about that. Uh, at the Thank God for Bitcoin conference. So I am very curious about how you kind of navigate the industry and a lot of like the regulatory environment. Because like you said, yeah, a lot of financial planners either ignore it or, you know, don't like it. But there's also, I I think, a lot of financial planners who maybe do own Bitcoin or open to that, but they're very scared of the whole, you know, the regulatory environment and they don't want to, you know, talk about it in the context of of their practice. So... I would be curious if you've run into any sort of trouble there, or if there's some special way you have to organize your business to enable that. Um, I mean, do you hold Bitcoin in inside some sort of, you know, managed account or do you just help your clients work through self custody? Yeah, those are great questions. So sort of inside baseball talk for financial advisors, but uh, yeah, I'm a, our firm, it's a, fee only RIA. We're registered in Texas. We have clients in lots of states, but primarily in Texas. Um, so I am uh, I'm currently uh, under Texas legislation for, for RIAs, financial planning firms. I underwent an audit last year. Basically in Texas, it's almost sort of guaranteed you're going to go through an audit in your first couple of years. And I, I went through one and you know, it was sort of painful, as, as fun as you'd expect any type of audit to be. Um, but surprisingly enough, there were really, there were no red flags regarding Bitcoin at all. I actually sort of brought that up to the guys auditing me and sort of, I tried to nudge them on it because I was really curious and they didn't seem at all curious even. Uh, it was odd. Now we do not take custody of our clients, Bitcoin assets. We, uh, we encourage self-custody. Um, we, be it through a single SIG or a multi-SIG setup, um, we help them buy it. We help them. Uh, we review it as part of, as an asset, but I view this as any other type of asset as, as money, not as a stock. And that's the same thing. The, the, the government at the, at the moment does not consider Bitcoin as, as an equity, um, but they view it as more of as a sense of property. So that, that also makes my job easier. It reduces the compliance mess with that, considering it's not this weird uh, unregistered security I'm dealing with. It's, it's more of a property. 
So yeah, we, yeah. we talk through it regularly and it's, it, it has not been a pain, but you certainly, you know, any advisor out there who's considering this, you want to be, you want to consider how are you, man- how are you advising on this? What are you referring to Bitcoin as? Are you talking about Bitcoin alone or are you talking about other crypto assets? Because that could certainly muddy the waters. You know, there's other cryptocurrencies right now that very well could be considered uh, as unregistered securities. And you could get in trouble later on for soliciting unregistered securities in the past. So you want to be really cognizant of what are you what are you talking to and what verbiage are you using? So that's that so that's where people bring in, especially in the financial space, there is a strong similar vein of bitcoin and and real estate or like property they're not the same but they have similar qualities in terms of how they're measured right now or regulated respectively yeah i mean so like i'm not um about about 70 percent of our clients own real estate outside of their primary residence yep so i'm not on the deed to their apartment complex or, or their duplex we talk to it. They say, mm-hmm. sometimes they come to me and they already own something or they're looking to buy something. Hey, Jim, can you review this deal for me? What are your thoughts on purchasing it and the note and strategy and whatever? I'll try to poke holes through it and give them my thoughts. And there's times that something comes up, if it's through a real estate syndication or something like that, and I'll present it to them and say, hey, here's the trade-offs. Here's my thoughts. Here's the risks. But uh, they are they are the ones owning this asset. I'm not taking custody of it. I'm not you know, managing it as I would like an investment account of normal, you know, equities and bonds. Uh, so it is, is quasi arm length, but at the same time, it's a conversation I embrace. Same thing. It's, it's sort of like a 401k. Like I'm not yep. managing the client's 401k plan, but I'm certainly, I'm, I'm telling them my thoughts on it. And we're bringing that into the scope of the financial planning conversation. So being the financial planner and your clientele being more of the, the, your clients typically possess Bitcoin, want to own Bitcoin, or coming to you, they have a pretty, they're pretty, you know, Bitcoin is like the pretty large chunk of their 80-20. How do you diversify a Bitcoiner without losing the integrity of what it means to hold Bitcoin? Ooh. Okay, so that's, so we have to get separate these into two camps. The vast yeah. majority of clients are not Bitcoin maxis, they're normal people who okay. I to ex- to understand Bitcoin and own it. Now, on average, I'd say our, our typical client has about 20, and that's increasing now. We're yeah. increasing the DCA right now towards Bitcoin. But uh, historically, our average client has been at about 20% of total investable assets has been in Bitcoin or Bitcoin-related things. Like uh, sometimes they own uh, mining companies inside Miners, of a Waffle yeah. IRA. Or something like Riot, that. Marathon, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll be in that space. Uh, but typically about 20% total asset allocation to the to Bitcoin, we'll call it. Um, and uh, right now we are increasing that. We, we had conversations. We meet proactively with all of our clients twice per year. So every February and every August, we're, we're mm-hmm. proactively engaging to talk through, like, where are you at in life? What's going on? What's going on with your money? What do we need to update? So our February conversation um, with our clients, we, we talked uh, uh in depth about the having cycles impacts their timing, not trying to time the market, but rather like the effects of uh, supply and demand uh, that the having cycle, I believe has at least right now. Yep. And uh, so right now we're, for most clients, we're reducing how much we're DCA dollar cost averaging into traditional assets. Maybe prior you were maxing out a 401k. Now we're dropping it down to company match and we're pressing our foot uh, harder on the pedal of Bitcoin acquisition. So maybe before you're at like a 80, 20, 80% normal assets, 20% yeah. Bitcoin. Now we're at like maybe closer to like a 60, 40 acquisition place or like a 65, 35, somewhere on there. Uh, so that's most of our clients. And I, I you know, obviously if, if Bitcoin does what I think it will do and where they're at now, like I think that in due time, uh, by the end of 2025, and I, who knows what Bitcoin's going to do, but I would, yeah. I would assume that by the end of 2025, that, you know, current, 30% allocation will probably consume about 80 to 90% of the total portfolio. Um, so we've also talked through how do we uh, divest out of this, um, not in totality, but I think it'd be foolish to not uh, consider your life when we look at mm-hmm. your, your money. So that's something we've talked through is um, uh, what, it, what it will look like. Right now we're increasing our DCA. 
What does it look like to reduce exposure over time? So our current strategy uh, would be to uh, the end of July or early August of 2025, we will begin dollar cost averaging out in tranches um, over a few month period until we've gone back to our target initial target allocation at the end of 2025, and then we'll rinse repeat in the next halving cycle. So by the end of 2025, early 2026, the target would be back down to about a 10 to 20% total allocation in Bitcoin. We'll take that exposure, putting it into something that's relatively uh, boring. That way we have dry powder for the next halving cycle. Um, and that, that's indicative of not only like portfolio risk, but also life. Like personally, my, my average client, we, we just recently started bringing on clients who are at a more of a traditional age and retirement, about to retire or already retired. But for the last two and a half years, I, I've, I've basically only worked with clients who are uh, younger. So my average client right now is 30. My average client is about 34, 35 year old married couple with a handful of kids. Hmm. About 80% of them own businesses. And about 70% of them own real estate outside of their primary residence. So I am basically my normal client. So I know the conversations they're having. I've, I've mm-hmm. worked with about 40,000 families over the years. I, I spent several of those years working with retirees and traditional clients. But now right the last several years have been focused on people like me. So I know the conversations they're having. I know what they're probably going to need their money for, not only because of me, but because of conversations I'm actually having with them, but personally. So my wife and I, we're looking to build a house. You know, I have four kids mm-hmm. and we're in a pretty small house and uh, we're ready to get a new one. And uh, personally, we're sort of waiting to do that until uh, Bitcoin's at a better price. So we're selling less Bitcoin to build that house. Um, but yeah, you better believe that I'm going to you know, almost uh, you know, reward our family and my wife and uh, for her patience and uh, show our the gratitude for really willing to stick, stick with me through this. And yeah, we'll, we'll sell some Bitcoin at that time to go purchase the house. And that will reduce our exposure. And maybe some Bitcoin maxes will think that's dumb and you should only rent and only own Bitcoin. But I'm not trying to optimize for people's wealth. I'm trying to people, help people actually use their money for what's important to them in life. And having a good home where we can make memories with my family is really important to us. So yeah, and that's that's the same place as clients. If it's buying a new house or starting a business, like you have to look at that as far as uh, ex- portfolio exposure as well. It's refreshing to hear somebody talk about Bitcoin as a means to improve their life as opposed to as a means to acquire more Bitcoin because it's like, Bitcoin's not going to feed you. Bitcoin's not going to, you know, put a, put a, necessarily a roof over your head. It, but how can you use it to help, um, you know, continue to improve uh, building wealth and building success, not just for you, but for your family and generations to come? And I feel like that gets, it, you know what I mean, Jim, when I'm talking about this, because it's like there's so many people out there that just say a lot of just stupid stuff. It's It's a refreshing perspective. And I know Connor would agree with that sentiment, too. So you well, I think it was, uh, as a means of improving life. And I think the alternative there that I commonly see is, is Bitcoin is their life. Uh, and yep. You have to remember, like, Bitcoin is money. And money is a tool that can be used to help you do what's important to you. It is simply a tool. It is not the end all. It's not the end state. Uh, and the moment you get there, like, that's a very unhealthy place to be in. So we have to keep that healthy perspective of what is the ultimate thing we're pursuing? How do we make sure our resources, our time, our money, our talents, our relationships are being utilized uh, in the most efficient, effective way for that. And Bitcoin is just a money that I think is more efficient and effective for serving those purposes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's, um, that's really what makes uh, a, an organization like thank God for Bitcoin so necessary to bring that type of conversation, you know, to the Bitcoin space. Um, I, I hear some people say like, maybe we can shift a little bit to some of the, the Christianity discussion here. But uh, I hear some people say that, you know, we really hope that the church could pick up on this Bitcoin thing because obviously there's a lot of good and there's a lot of benefit there, uh, you know, for the church. But I also see that there's a lot of good and a lot of benefit for the Bitcoin community uh, and the current Bitcoin influencers, current, uh, you know, Bitcoiners that could really benefit from having this Christian conversation come to them. And, uh, you know, something like thank God for Bitcoin that's bringing that to the space is like so necessary for exactly those reasons. So I'm kind of curious uh, how you came across that, how you came involved with that. I know you were a panelist at uh, Thank God for Bitcoin. Has that been something you've been working with for a while now? Or was that your first conference? What's the deal there? Yeah, that was my first conference. Uh, Jordan reached out to me and asked if I would like to be involved in some capacity. And I did some research on the organization itself. I am. Um, I'm, I want to be cognizant of who I share a stage with. 
Um, I don't want to send mixed signals as to the message that I'm bringing. Um, and also want to be cognizant of what, uh, what message overall is being propagated to the masses. So um, I did some research to see my, get my thoughts, you know, uh, what is the ultimate message here? There's a lot of people in this space as non-Christians who like fix the money, fix the world, or, you know, Bitcoin fixes X, like Bitcoin will make families better. Bitcoin will make you better. And maybe to some extent that Bitcoin is not salvation. And uh, I didn't want people to think that I was, that's the message I was propagating. Um, and I think there's some even people who are Christians uh, out there who are um, overstepping the bounds of the message of Bitcoin and almost uh, uh, propagating a gospel of Bitcoin, um, which can certainly mix signals with with the world as far as understanding like really what is this thing and what is you know, we have this like Bitcoin savior complex and that's really unhealthy. And I don't want anyone to have a signal that they think that that is what I'm saying. Uh, so I was very, uh, you know, I do my due diligence in anything, in any stage I share, but yeah, it was certainly part of it. And I made, I made sure that I was very clear at the end of the panel I spoke on uh, to, <laughs> to make that very evident what I was saying. Cause again, like that's who cares? Like, yeah, you see all these things in Bitcoin space. And I like, like I love people on in Bitcoin Twitter and all that fun stuff. I just hung out with them for a week and, absolutely love my time, but there's a lot of messages that are, that are, that are off. You know, there's a, there's this theme of like, you own Bitcoin, you get married, you have lots of kids, you eat beef, you, uh, I don't know, you get sun and, uh, you don't eat seed oils and suddenly the world's a better place and everyone's going to be happy. And like your work, your life's going to be better. It's like, dude, you're missing the whole picture. If you think, if you think that owning Bitcoin and getting married is good, is the end of the end of life, like you're wrong. Um, there's this place of seeking truth supposedly amongst Bitcoiners, yet Jesus says that he is the truth. So and I strongly believe that if you continue to pursue truth and ultimate truth without uh, without biases, or you're willing to lay those biases down, or at least aside, or at least recognize that I do have biases, and let's, let's navigate this without those, um, you will arrive at Jesus. And it's inevitable. Um, so I, I hope that Bitcoin is a means of simply pulling those threads of asking questions, being curious about what else is there. Um, but Anyone who gets to Bitcoin and says, oh, that's it. It's the world or the, the, the money itself is the source of all these problems. Um, no, it's not the case. You know, you, you see manipulation of scripture amongst Bitcoiners a lot. Like Christians and not, non-Christians who bring in these things of like, oh, Jesus came for socioeconomic or just regular or economic uh, um, fairness and equality. Or he came in and like, they quote this, this, you know, scripture about like Jesus flipping the tables in the temple because like, as if it was because monetary uh, injustice was his main cause. Like, no, it's because people were making a mockery of his temple. And it says that if you're a Christian, you're the temple of God. He wants to flip your tables if you're, if you are doing something wrong in your heart, if you're the temple of God, it's not about like monetary injustice alone. Like that is, you're off base if you think that's it. Like that's, you're not even, you're not even skimming the surface. So there's that or like, oh, well, you know, the, uh, the equal, uh, equal weights and the, uh, the scales, like that's, that's it. It's like, dude, it's, you, you haven't touched on it. Like if you don't believe in, if you don't believe in a God, at least like, how do you even define morality? And, uh, you have to continue to pull that thread. Like what is morality? Like, how do you, how do you arrive at these things? How do you arrive as a, as an atheist Bitcoiner who believes in truth and morality I think if you take a intellectually honest uh, uh, pursuit of that, you cannot say that there is morality or truth without a God. Um, so I, I, I genuinely hope that the people in this space do not stop this pursuit of truth at Bitcoin. Otherwise, you know, you're you stopped way too short. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And I like you. I uh, I attended the the Bitcoin Miami conference uh, last year, so that would have been 2022. But I opted not to in 2023, just because I wasn't I wasn't particularly impressed with um, certain things that I was seeing at the conference. And uh, I love thank God for Bitcoin. You know, I love having these types of conversations with Christians and and uh, Bitcoin maxis and you know all sorts of people that are willing to pursue you know those lines of truth. But uh, sometimes it does seem like it gets lost in this space, like you were even mentioning. There's definitely some misappropriation of uh, of scripture happening, you know, in various avenues. So 
again, we're just super thankful that you're willing to come on and speak to us. I know you're a Bitcoin maxi. I know our podcast, the Crypto Conversion Podcast, may not you know square well with those beliefs, but um, but I, I really appreciate the statement you just made. I think that's like that's exactly the message that we need to send to the space, and we need to be supporting all these Christians like yourself and like uh, you know Jordan and all these other Christians that are in the space that are bringing that kind of message. Um, we really need to uh, rally around each other and support. So I'm glad to hear that. And um, maybe also we could talk a little bit about Dave Ramsey. I'll put that on the t- docket because I think a lot of Christians, when they think of financial planning, the first thing they're going to think of is Dave Ramsey. He's definitely the biggest voice in the space. And even non-Christians, a lot of people have gotten a lot of help from Dave. And um, what I love about Dave is I, I'm i very anti-debt. I don't like uh, mm-hmm. you know this, this economy that we've built for ourselves that uh, is – relying on instant gratification and, uh, you know, building these kind of material gains at the expense of much more important things and also just accumulating debt that we're not going to pay back. Uh, so I think that message that he brings uh, to the economy and to people's finances is super needed. Um, but he's also not really pro Bitcoin from what I understand. <laughs> understand. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm yeah, just but curious, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't hate it as much as like some people think he does. Like he's, he's not, he's just not about that ever. Like, but for the record, like he, I have heard him speak on the principles of Bitcoin and he doesn't hate them. He just knows it's not for him. Well, I, I think some of it's too, just like a generational thing. Yeah. Like, that, to be honest, yeah. like this, there's some things that, uh, you know, people who are much older just are going to struggle with this concept. Like even just explaining Bitcoin alone is a challenge. So I think there's an amount of that going on, but I, I'm just curious, Jim, like what's your, what's your thoughts on Dave Ramsey? And, uh, do you think he's going to, you think he's ever going to come around? Uh, or do you think, uh, do you think he just is what he is? Uh, thoughts on Dave. I, I probably went through financial, financial peace university six, seven times before being out of high school. Wow. You know, I think if you grew up in the South or in the Bible belt, you probably are familiar <laughs> with Dave. Um, I'm in Texas. My my brother and uh, his family were living out in Nashville and like really close to Dave. So like, I mean, it's a pretty big deal in the South. So uh, yeah, really familiar with his stuff, read his books, been through his courses a zillion times. Um, as far as his principles go, you know, like spend less than you make, live below your means, things like that. Like if, if all of America just followed those basic principles, yeah, economically, we would be in a much healthier place, obviously. So if we could convey one message of that, if we could just glean that thing, like, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Now, do I, do I agree with all of his stances amongst all things financial? No. Like, I, I you know, as far as owning, having debt, like, you know, I understand he's talking to the masses. Mm-hmm. But, you know, let's say a couple of years ago, you call him to his show and you have a mortgage at 2%. Yeah. And uh, say, hey, should I pay off this mortgage? And he's like, yes, pay it off now. So you go pay it off. But what if you were also wanting to buy and needing, like, I don't know, for some reason you're, you're wanting to buy it. He would just tell you not to buy it. But let's, say, let's put that aside. Let's say you're also wanting to buy a, an investment property um, and you need to put money down for that. And now you're going to go put money down for an investment property and all you have is 20% to put down and you're carrying a note at like 8.5% on that. When instead of paying down your note at 2% in full, you could have had that cash that you paid off. You could have gone and taken that to pay off in full this new note that's carried at 8%. You know, it's like you can't take these broad strokes of people's specific financial lives. Um, so there's a place of being a generalist and those general principles are healthy to an extent, but you want to be cognizant of that. Now, relating to Bitcoin in, uh, in particular, um, yeah, he's not a Bitcoin er right now. Um, I think if he were to pull on that thread hard enough and long enough, he would find that uh, a lot of his principles that he's espousing uh, actually are aligned with Bitcoin. Um, and would actually do really well in the space. Um, but I think there's a place of being entrenched deeply in the traditional financial sector, um, even though he's, he's very different than Wall Street. Um, he still is entrenched, in a way, in the traditional financial sphere. Um, and he has a message, and his message is a certain thing. And if he goes and changes that message, it, uh, it could mean a lot for him. So there's that. I think he's also just super busy. I think there's there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin space who uh, you know, maybe have turned him off to 
Bitcoin itself. So it's it's skewing his observance of it. You know, if you if your first encounter with something is very negative, you sort of want that thing that that negative person was espousing. You want that to not be true because you want them to be right. You know, that takes a lot of humility to say, you know what, despite me not liking that person or how they presented this thing, I still want to know the truth about the thing they presented itself. So I think that's a danger with a lot of people around. I think there's a lot of people who don't like Bitcoin, not because of Bitcoin, but because of uh, Bitcoiners and their first encounter. You know, it's like, oh man, I would hate for that that guy to be be the right one here. Like, uh, so yeah, I think that, that 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 probably plays a role in it. Um, yeah, I think if you took a fair stance or a fair look at it, though, uh, you know, I think you come out the other side and, uh, yeah, yeah, align with hard money. Um, yeah, especially I mean, his views. Bitcoin encourages. Uh, a a time preference that is antagonistic to our current state, which is very aligned with him. Like his his time preference is very different than most Americans, and uh, I think he would wholeheartedly support that at least. And that is a big principle of Bitcoin itself. Yeah, it is very curious, isn't it? Uh, I mean, Bitcoin. If you're against debt and you're against you know these kind of institutions, like the U.S. dollar is built on these types of institutions. Like it relies on it. Like it's built into the monetary policy. Um, and, uh, you know, you, if you're really anti that, you're like, you need an alternative system. And that's really my argument for Bitcoin, you know, from the mole stance. It's just like, we see what USD stands for. And we see who the people who create USD, create the fiat system. Like we see how they can use, um, you know, mon- monetary policy as as a weapon, really, against, uh, you know, people who they don't agree with and things like that. And uh, particularly as Christians, we see it used against Christians in a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, you can choose to participate in that system or you can choose to say, hey, I think this system is immoral and I'm going to participate in a different system, you know, Bitcoin. Um, And uh, so it seems like Dave Ramsey's like really like more than halfway there. But, you know, why is he still like promoting USD? Like, I don't know. It just seems like a dichotomy there. But I think you're right. Like if he just understood it, if it could have just been explained to him uh, or maybe he had a better example, you know, from people uh, he was seeing, then then maybe he would come around to that. But. This is my thought. This, I'm just I'm cracking up right now because I'm on Twitter on my other screen and the spaces that's open up. Grant Cardone is hosting a space called uh, "Bitcoin is Getting Ready to Crash," and I'm just like it just it just kind of cracks me up. Um, not to not to shift gears, but I am just curious, like if it, you know, putting your finger up, looking at the wind how do you see things right now jim with with the with where bitcoin is going and heading obviously we're all anticipating this having but you know if just not saying we have the crystal ball but just based on the historical trends and and charts i'm i'm curious what your sentiment is and if it's it's similar to mine because if i'm if i'm following historical trends something's going to happen in either you know next year next spring or you know even going into 2025 but i i what are your thoughts based on just the the current market and i know the the economy has a little bit to do with it going into an election year all that fun stuff but i what are what do the winds say based on the charts from your perspective I'll answer this in two ways. First, I'll answer it to specific, uh, Bitcoin specifically, and then I'll answer it in a more general macroeconomic. Perfect. And, uh, yeah, just where we are as a country and the world. Um, so Bitcoin specifically, obviously, it's a scarce asset. And uh, when you have a scarce asset and you have a fixed demand and an increased demand, well, then you should expect the value of that asset to increase. And that's, in my opinion, that's why we see this uh, ebb and flow of uh, purchasing power increase with coinciding with having cycles. Um, that's I think it's very simple to understand. I'm not smart. I'm not by, by no means my, my the smartest guy out there. But uh, you look at this. It's like all right, if 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 demand is reaches reaches an equilibrium with supply relatively, and then new supply is suffocated. But demand stays the same. Well, then it's going to cause uh, the the purchasing power of that thing to go up, or the price of that thing to go up. Um, and then if that happens, everyone out there who thinks that Bitcoin is dead at the moment is going to say, "Oh, I thought thing, I think I thought that thing died. Um, maybe I'll go get a little bit." So now you have an increased supply coinciding with a reduced 
uh, new supply or an increased demand coinciding with a reduced new supply. So then you have a, uh, a magnification of uh, the supply demand impact of price, which leads it to run up further. And then eventually you reach this place of, uh, again, irrational exuberance um, and speculation where people start doing silly things and get over their skis. And then we see people, uh, the, the, the dominoes start to fall, which, which generally leads this uh, 70, 80% decrease in price, uh, which leads us to a bear market. And then we rinse and repeat. Long-term holders stick through it. Um, they continue stacking. We reach a somewhat you know, price equilibrium. And then the next having marches along. Will that be the case forever? I don't think so. Um, I, don't, I certainly don't think that the having cycles are baked into the price right now. Um, by any means, um, will it will it stay that way forever? I no, I, I don't think that's the case. I think we'll eventually reach this place. Obviously, the the having cycles uh, will also see a uh, diminishing uh, impact of the having cycles as well. You know, it, it was you know, fifty, then twenty five, then twelve and a half, and six point two five. So the amount of the impact of the half is drastically smaller over time as the having cycles march along over the next hundred and whatever we got seventeen years. Um, so lost uh, coins been mined. Now that's that's Bitcoin specifically. Now where we are is a macroeconomic uh, standpoint. Um, there's a lot of things going on. Again, I don't know if I if I knew exactly what was going to happen, I'd be you know living it up in the in, a, no, I, uh, in the Cayman yeah, Islands. We, uh, I was going to say we we'd all be on our yacht right now. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, no question. Uh, it, yeah. Here, here's my thoughts. I talk to a lot of people. I see a lot of things. I've, I've researched some stuff, um, and I don't know. No, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, there's. Right now, I think the job numbers are a lot worse than they look. Um, you okay. know, the, the the market did poorly. Was it yesterday? Because the house, the job numbers looked good, and the yep. market didn't like that because they thought, "Oh man, that means the Fed's going to keep raising or raising rates." Yep. Well, it's ironic because the market goes down because job numbers look good because we don't want the Fed to raise rates. But the jobs, I don't think, are nearly as good as the numbers make them look. Um, I mean, how many people out there today are working multiple jobs compared to thirty years ago? I think it's a lot more. Um, I mean, I have a lot of uh, clients who work in tech, most of most of which who have been laid off in the last eight months. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's pretty indicative of the overall market itself. You mix that with, I mean, you marry that with inflation. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, um, that, that, that I guess this goes inside with the next point, which is student loans. So student loan payments, um, from when we're recording this, student loan payments resume in about a week and a half. Um, so most people between the age of 25 and like 45 are about to get squeezed big time on their monthly spending. Because what happened here is a few years ago, you had a student loan payment, let's call it 350 bucks. And you're making it all right. You know, you can go to, you can go, you can go out to brunch, you get avocado, tw- avocado tw- toast twice a week, once a week. Let's say it's once a week. And you're making your student loan payment. You're feeling all right. Okay. Well, then uh, March 2020 comes along and, uh, Suddenly everything shut down. You can't go buy your toast anymore. You got to stay in your house, and make your own toast. And uh, student loans were frozen. So that 350 bucks that you were spending is suddenly uh, extra money you got coming in and you were given a COVID relief check. So you got a couple grand there. So everyone's feeling great. Then you have, meanwhile, you have people, you know, like me and a lot of other, most other people who pay attention to this stuff screaming from the rooftops that, uh, you know, this is probably going to lead to inflation. The Fed and a lot of people have their heads in the sand about that, though. But you're marching along, you know, feeling great. Your student loan's gone for right now. It's probably going to be forgiven at that time. That was a sentiment. And you've got your extra 350 bucks to spend. Um, well, over time, as the months and the years marched on, that $350, the real $350 started getting siphoned away. And to where we are at present date, that, yeah, you have the extra 350 bucks today. But man, you are barely making it. You know, you were before this, you were going to brunch once a week. And then after, you know, once the COVID lockdowns were done, but your student loans uh, were still frozen, but inflation hadn't been packed yet, you're going to brunch all the time. You're feeling great. And then over time, it went back to one brunch a week. Now you're not eating brunch at all. You're not going out. You better watch what you're spending. And uh, the pin hasn't even dropped yet with those student loans. So in about a week and a half, everyone right now is feeling real squeezed. In a week and a half, you're about to be hit in the face again with that $350 student loan payment. And a lot of people in their 20s to 40s, 50s, I mean, there's people in their 60s with student loans. 
are about to all suddenly be barely, they're barely making it now. They're going to have this big payment coming and uh, it's going to be really painful. I, f- I really feel bad for these people. I think it's going to, I mean, some, suddenly like co- consumer spending will drop. I would be astonished if it doesn't. Consumer spending will drop. Um, companies are going to start, you know, making reduction of workforces. That's going to lead to unemployment. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think at that point by early spring, I don't think the government's going to be able to ignore the unemployment rates anymore. They won't be able to put it over patches of people running multiple uh, service jobs. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're going to have that. The Fed's going to keep raising rates. They, they mentioned that yesterday. I think they're going to definitely going to keep doing that. I don't think they're going to be proactive just that they weren't pro- proactive these last few times. They're going to keep raising rates into this. And uh, again, I'm, I'm totally guessing here, but I would say like, I don't know, April, we'll call it, I don't know, somewhere between March and May. I think that things are going to get really ugly. It's going to hurt a lot. Who knows what Bitcoin's going to do between now and then? I don't know. We'll watch towards the having, and maybe Bitcoin does great. Maybe it does poorly because everything else gets wiped out. Who, who knows? But I think around that time, um, you have to consider that next year is an election year as well, next fall. No one wants to be reelected in the middle of a uh, market turmoil. And they don't want it too fresh on people's minds either. So all of these things bearing, I would, I would suppose, would lead to a Fed pivot sometime around April, May of next year. I think it'll start off maybe a little soft, but it's going to move to a hard pivot uh, pretty quick. And uh, I think that will that nice Fed pivot will marry well with the Bitcoin halving cycle. I'm probably way off, but I'll, <laughs> that's my that's my viewpoint, and I'll stand by it for right now. No, I probably think I the best analysis we've had on the show to date, in my opinion, Connor. To be honest, it was yeah, it was. I think it was a well reasoned analysis. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm trust me, I'm not going to take that and run with it. But what you're saying is similar to a lot of other smart people that I am surrounded by, uh, say in similar ways, shapes or forms. Um, fortunately, where I sit with my day job, I, I get to, I get to see the impacts of this on a couple different levels. And you're, you're not, you're not too far off. So that's, it, it's, it's, it's ugly. I'm not going to tell it everybody it's refreshing perspective it's gonna suck but it's uh you know you you see it in the stores right now like shoot target is trying to get people to buy more product just so they can give them a ten dollar gift card i'm like man you're really trying to squeeze people for for extra cash just to get them to buy everyday essentials it's like well i mean I, yeah I'm, I'm i'm gonna use the diapers anyway so i might as well get the extra two cases because I, you know, but it's funny because they put it on other stuff too. And it's like, who's going to buy like an extra two or three things of that. If it's going to go bad, like just to get a $10 gift card, it was, it's hilarious. The things you see right now for, for those big box companies to incentivize the consumer to, to buy more um, just to get a handout out of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. You know, right now you go out and uh, it would seem that most people aren't living in reality in regards to their spending. I think everyone's mm-hmm. feeling it. In fact, I feel it. I've got four kids, I, my wife and I, like, I don't make a ton of money uh, by any means, but uh, we're doing all right. And I'm not living this high life by at all. Um, so we, we feel the inf- impact of inflation. Um, and I know, like, I, I certainly live in a privileged spot in life that is... Um, a little bit more comfortable than, than the majority, I guess, despite not making a ton. And I, I just know, like, man, a lot of people are really hurting this. But uh, we've 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 grown so accustomed to our standard of living, that it's really hard to get rid of those things. You know, it's hard to yep. get rid of the things you've you've been used to for the last decade. So until you're really forced, you're not going to go there. So right now, it's it's tough for me. Like again, I I've worked in this in the finance industry for long enough, and I've had a zillion conversations. I I've talked to normal people and I know the state I've, I've, I've seen behind the curtain of the average person's money that I'm sort of jaded. Like if I go out to a restaurant sure. or whatever, and I see people buying things, I'm at the mall, not that I ever go to the mall, but if I were to go to the mall, you know, I see people buying stuff and it's like, I know like the vast majority of those people, you shouldn't be buying that. I know what your money looks like. And uh, that's, you have that. It's, it's sad because when they realize it, they're going to be a lot of pain. You know, the, the number one cause of divorce in the U.S. year over year is money. It's like, man, you may not realize it right now, but like this is going to lead to some hard conversations. It's going to lead to a lot of stress. Come on, think about it. Is this, how important is this thing to you? So there's that. And then obviously the, the, the money impact that it has just on people like inflation. You know, inflation is really, uh, it's sad to think through. Like one thing that always gets me choked up is thinking about like uh, maybe a, 
an older lady who is living off a pension that her husband acquired through a job. And maybe he passed away and she got the pension, but this pension does not have a cost of living adjustment or has a really small COLA. Now you have this 74 year old lady who's living off this, this pension and some social security. And she's in a place now that she is not able to eat well at all. Yep. And, and, and she has a shift at subway. Yep. I, yes. Yeah. Yep. That's really sad. Like, you know, yes. Inflation impacts me, but what about her? Like, she's, mm-hmm. she's not going to go get more clients. She's not going to go start another no. business. She's going to stop eating as much. You know, like she'll eat hot no. dogs twice a day. Like that's really sad. Um, I remember when, when groceries started picking up a lot, probably, I don't know, it was like a year and a half ago. Um, these last few years all sort of blur together. Um, there's probably about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago when, when groceries started picking up a bunch. And I would always ask the, the, the kids back in my groceries, like how, how many people like percentage wise, uh, comment on the higher grocery prices. And they were, you know, they're saying it was a lot. But I remember specifically I was having the conversation and actually the lady behind me, she didn't hear us. And as we're having that conversation, she got her total on her groceries. It was like nothing. You can tell she was, she was the cliche cat lady. She was buying like not good food and food for her cat. And when they got her bill, uh, this look of terror on her face hit her. And it was the look of like, can I do this and this other thing? It's like, man, that's really sobering. Like for me, it's like, well, uh, you know, you know, that hurts. I guess I can't save as much as much. I guess we can't do this little thing. But for her, it's like, man, like, well, I build my groceries next week. I have a fixed income that is being uh, inflated away. And this is my cost. This is my lifestyle. Like the, the house that my husband and I lived in and raised our family in, can I afford this? Will those memories be moved away from because of this? Like that, mm-hmm. that itself, like that, that really motivates me, motivates me to have these conversations. It's that. And then like, yeah, yeah the, the causes of the, the talks of families and divorce and doing things that are important to you. Like, yeah, I, I, I my clients pay me to care about their money. I've studied a lot about money and I care about the money in that sense. But I'm way, way more interested. And I care way more about you, your life, um, your family. Like that, that's really what I care about. Of course, I want to steward your money well, because those things are there to help you do what's important to you. But I have to be, I can never grow tired of caring about people. The moment I lose that, it's lost anyways. Yep. Like, who cares? True, true, true stuff. And it stinks that we're, we're, we're parting on such sour notes here, but it's, it's, as you mentioned, it's, it's sobering terms and things that need to get discussed at a high level um, with the masses. And so these are critical conversations to have in, in times like this. So um, yeah, it, it just feels like what happened, the aftermath of 2008 never got solved. And here we sit, just you know more black swans and yeah i don't know what's next nobody does nobody has that crystal ball but um the only thing we can do is continue making measured decisions and doing what's best and if you're able-bodied and and have the ability to work to just go out there roll up your sleeves and do what you can and yeah i mean it's gonna stink because it's gonna feel like we're gritting our teeth and yeah i i don't know how what i'm trying to land the plane here with, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot to take on, but, um, yeah, ultimately as we're closing things out, Jim, um, where can people find you? Um, what, what's the best way if, if anybody wants to take advantage of your services, uh, just kind of give you the floor here as, as we close things out. And, uh, it's been great having you on though. Sure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, my handle is Jim Kreider TX is in Texas. Um, you can email me. My email is Jim dot at intentional living FP as in financial planning. So Jim Kreider at uh, Jim dot Kreider at intentional living FP dot com. Or you can go to our website. It's intentional living FP dot com. And on there uh, on the homepage, there is a link to my calendar. You can schedule 15 minutes. If you want to talk about financial planning, that's great. You can schedule 15 minutes. If you just have a question, I don't care what it is. If you have a question about Bitcoin or your 401k, ask away and I'll give you the best I can in the time we've got. So more than happy to talk with anyone if you just have some questions and help you out in any way I can. Yeah, this this was awesome. And uh, as always, this is the this is the crypto conversion podcast. 
Please like, comment, review, subscribe wherever podcasts are found, and especially on our YouTube channel here where this will be showing. Uh, Jim, it was great having you on. Great to meet you as well. Um, hope to have you back sometime as as we continue getting our bearings and what this Christian crypto content making world is like. But it was a pleasure and uh, best of luck to you. And uh, we appreciate you hopping on. So everybody have a great rest of your week. Peace.